Hi everyone, welcome back to the Tap HR podcast. I'm really pleased to say that we're on episode 11. I say that every time, but I don't know why it surprises me, but this is episode 11. Um, so today I'm joined by the absolutely amazing Anita Ascot Brooks. <laughs> Hello, Anita. Well, thank you. <laughs> And today we're going to be talking about how to give effective performance feedback. So with all of the podcasts, I try and keep it conversational, but obviously we'll make sure that there are some nuggets in there for you as employers or HR professionals to learn from. So performance feedback, Anita, what what exactly is that? How would you define it? This is a subject. Good afternoon, by the way. I forgot to say that. I love this subject. I absolutely love talking about performance feedback because I've worked with many managers over my years and, and the, how people define performance feedback is, is very, very different. The, the proper definition of feedback is an ongoing process between an employee and a manager where they exchange information um, concerning kind of the expected performance level that people have um, versus the performance exhibited. So constructive feedback can praise good performance or correct poor performance. Um, and should always be tied in with kind of performance standards, really. So it's based on evidence rather than just hearsay or well, I think kind of phrases. So that's kind of what feedback should be. And how is it different to just having kind of a general conversation with an employee? Obviously, I hear what you're saying in terms of it needs to be based on evidence. So as an employer, how do I know that I need to have a performance conversation or what performance conversation looks like, as opposed to me just having a chat with somebody? Well, I suppose the first thing to recognise is there's there's um, formal routes to performance feedback, and then there's informal routes. So if you have if you follow a performance appraisal process, I don't know what that might be within the organisation. Some have a much more fluid kind of monthly mm-hmm. um, process. Other organisations still do the quarterly or perhaps mid year and end of year process. But whichever route you take, we should never leave feedback to that point in time. Mm-hmm. Feedback should be ongoing. So, for example, it might be, let's say, if you manage me, Trish, for example, and I did something really, really well today, then, you know, we should always make sure that feedback is timely. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you have that conversation, as you'd like to add, but, you know, in effective feedback style, um, you would have that with me in a timely manner. When we then do the kind of formal part of performance feedback, it should be almost like a summary. Mm -hmm. So. Let's say um, if I was due my performance review at the end of, um, where are we now, October, end of November, then, you know, you would then collate all the feedback you've given me over the last period, whatever that period may have been, and summarise that as part of that kind of formal process. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you wait, let's say, for example, if I did something today that wasn't acceptable behaviour, if you were to wait now and not give, that, give me that feedback until the end of November, how is that timely? Yeah. You know, I'm not going to change anything between now and then. And that could cause me problems and the organisation problems in that time. Mm. So it's important, no matter what that feedback is, it's done in a timely manner and it's based on evidence. Mm. Can't, yeah. And I will say that a lot. <laughs> it's got to be based on evidence. <laughs> I think that timeliness point is, is really important. because I think when you get into the realms of there's a potential disciplinary situation, I've had a lot of managers come to me to say, oh, this person's been underperforming for a really long period of time. And I'll mm-hmm. say, you know, well, have you spoken to them about it? And I'll say, no, given yeah. them a chance to improve. No. So they've got no idea what they're doing wrong and you haven't told them that you want to do something that's kind of quite serious in terms of a disability. Yeah. So I completely echo that point around timeliness. I think it's so important to make sure that people understand what's expected of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what does effective performance feedback look like then? What should I be doing and, and what should that look and feel like? Okay, so a few kind of tips on that. So it should be frequent, it should be as and when required, but equally it should be planned. Mm. So sometimes, well, I say it should be planned. I think to be as, fe- as effective as it can be, the whole purpose of feedback is about improving somebody's level of confidence and competence. So and when you start off using feedback models, and I've got a few that I'll share with you today, which are brilliant, um, practice them, practice them, practice them. And once you're then comfortable with that kind of format of them, then it will be much easier to do these things kind of off pat. Mm. But if, until you get to that point, do spend a bit of time kind of formatting your feedback. I remember years ago, I had to give feedback when I was a, a team manager um, and it was really challenging it, and, it, and, I, and I really struggled with it. And I, the only way that I could get my head around it, because it was quite, you know, challenging feedback to give, 
was to sit and almost write it out word for word in terms of what I was going to say. Now, I didn't then stand in front of this person reading my script, as it were. I didn't do that. But what I did was kind of help memorize some of it so that it helped me feel more confident um, whilst delivering that feedback. So prep it. Write it out. Perhaps run it by somebody, a trusted colleague or somebody you know. That's a really good way of kind of sense checking mm. um, what you've got. So make sure it's frequent and relevant at the time. Um, it's something that they can action. Now, again, um, I'm not mentioning any names, but I, somebody said to me a long time ago, I was working with an organization and their manager literally said to them that you are at your job. Fill in the blanks yourself, however you want to, whatever words you want to put in there. Now, one, that's just a shocking thing and that we should never be talking to people like that anyway. But two, what is that individual going to do with that feedback? Mm. You know, it doesn't tell me what I should be doing differently. It doesn't talk about expectations. There's nothing in there that's going to help me be even better at my role. So it's really important that the feedback is actionable. I can do something with it, take it away. Um, mm. And that by do it again, if it's something I've done really well, or it might be actually I need to stop doing that and I need to rethink the way I do that. Mm. Um, it should be focused on behaviours and actions as well so it should be on things again like I said that people are going to be able to change and ongoing and based on facts based on evidence not on just oh well I think you are and a great example I always use there is if you're perhaps giving somebody some feedback on how late they've been perhaps they're always rocking up late for work it's really easy to sit there and go oh you're always late and just make a throwaway comment now if I was in front of you I would say no I'm not I wasn't late yesterday I wasn't late the day before because I'd be a bit pedantic about it and you will have people who do that because that is it's just a generalized statement it doesn't mean anything whereas if you were to say to somebody in the last four weeks you've actually been late into the office five times for example mm -hmm. It's based on that evidence. And then it's much harder for the other person to push back or to disagree with it because you've got that evidence there in front of you. Mm. So I can't stress enough how important that is. And, and also things like, you know, we should be basing it on behaviours and actions, not on somebody's personality. So you wouldn't say to somebody, oh, you're really lazy. <laughs> and some people think that's okay and acceptable to say that. And it really isn't, you know, you would, what you would do is base it on their task, what they haven't achieved. So, you know, you're meant to get A, B, C and D done by the end of this week. And actually you've only done A. Let's talk about what stopped that happening. Mm. So, it, again, it's very much evidence. So it makes your life a lot easier as the person giving the feedback. And you talked about models as well. So are there things that people can rely on to help in terms of giving effective feedback? Mm. Definitely. Um, so there's a couple of models I'll share with you. So there's one called the SBI model, which is brilliant. A three-step model, and it literally is focusing on the situation, the behavior, and the impact. Okay. So under situation, we need to describe what that situation was when this, whatever it was, occurred. Um, and we need to be specific about where and when it occurred as well. The behavior is about describing what you've seen, what you've observed. And don't at this point assume that you know what the other person's thinking because you don't. OK, all you know is what you've observed in that moment. And then the final part is that impact. So describe what you thought or felt in reaction to the behaviour that's been demonstrated. So if I give you an example, Trish, I'm just going to make one off of the top of my head. So um Trish, yesterday in the team meeting where you shared the latest update of all things TAP HR and everything that's going on with the organisation, you came across really clearly and concisely. I very clearly understood by the end of that presentation where we were at um, and what our goals and aims are for the next six to 12 months. The impact of that is that I know exactly where I fit into that. So I can absolutely help towards achieving that vision moving forward. So very clear then by the end of that bit of feedback for you you know exactly when you did this thing well what you did and the impact that that's had on me in, which in this example was a positive impact mm. that is so much better than if I'd have just said to you well done Trish on that presentation yesterday it was great mm. because it's nice to hear that in the moment isn't it and you kind of go oh that's nice <laughs> 
But actually, if we're looking to create long term change or um, create continued good performance, saying somebody's good at the job is not going to do that. OK, it's really important we evidence it every time. So that's the first model. And then the second model I've got is another one called um, the honest conversation model. This one, again, three step process. Um, first one is viewpoint, evidence and ask. So similar to what we've just covered, but a slightly different ending. So my viewpoint is whatever that viewpoint might be. My evidence for this viewpoint is this. And then ending it up with a question would be something like, what are your thoughts on that? Now, the difference between those two, again, both based on evidence, is that you're throwing open that question. So it's more of an open conversation starter rather than a kind of a finished um, feedback piece, as it were. Um, and that can be really good in terms of if you're not sure about where they're coming from, um, if you just want to have like more of a conversation around it rather than just deliver that feedback. Um, but again, that can be used for, you know, situations where you want behavior to change or behavior where you're, you know, you're pleased with it and you want it to continue. So that's another good model. Do you want me to share another one? I mean, I've got so many. <laughs> I'm gonna, I think maybe let's keep one back. <laughs> Just okay. keep guessing a little bit. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> what about people who are a little bit nervous about giving feedback? So I've had managers in the past who, who maybe don't want to, uh, are worried about upsetting someone. They don't want to give what they feel could be negative feedback. And, you know, we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but then they've maybe not given the feedback at all and the person's not been aware. How can we help? people like that and excuse the dog he's obviously very upset about something that's Dexter's <laughs> welcome to join the conversation <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think first of all don't think you're alone with that I have worked with many managers who feel that way about giving feedback I've worked with people oh, excuse my phone that was very rude have my phone back on the background um I've worked with many managers who feel uncomfortable giving feedback when there's been there's poor performance, but also the opposite of that, because people just don't know how to structure it. So, you know, don't think it's just you. Lots of people feel that way. And that's why having a model can really help. If you can, you can use that model, you can hang, you know, what it is you want to say. And if you follow those processes that we just talked through, that can really, really help in terms of that. Because then you won't go down the route of that's really good, you know, and just saying some throwaway comment that doesn't mean anything. So you have a model that you like, and I would suggest perhaps try both of those that I just shared there, the honest conversation and the SBI model. Try them both, see what you like, but equally don't forget feedback is also dependent on the person you're giving it to. Communication is two-way, it has to resonate, it has to land with them. So making sure Dexter's really going for it, isn't he, today? <laughs> I've got Jack's going to come and sort him out. So, all of you who's in listeners, the dog will be sorted out shortly. <laughs> Adds a bit of a bit more, makes, makes it even more human, Tris, I always think. Um, so, yeah, so um, I've totally lost my train of thought now. Yes, yeah, so try the models, try them out, but make them fit the person who's receiving the feedback as well. That's really, really important. Um, and, and I always think as a manager, I'll ask those kind of questions. You know, how do you like your feedback to be delivered? And some people will say, just sock it to me. Tell me what it is. And other people say, oh, I like a bit of good and a little bit of bad. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer. I don't know if you remember the praise sandwich model. Do you remember oh, that yeah. one from years ago where it was, you're doing this really well, but this is rubbish. But you're doing this really well. I hate that model because the bit that we only remember is the bit in the middle. Mm. OK, so if you're going to give feedback, still follow a structure. Um, and, and that will give you that, you know, the outcome that you're looking for in terms of them being able to increase their confidence or their competence. So that would be one, having some models that you're comfortable using. And you may not like either of the ones I've shared today. If you Google it, there are lots of different ones um, on the Internet. I like these because I know they work and they're ones I've used. And I know lots of managers I've worked with that use them as well. So they're really good ones from that perspective. Um, secondly, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. I suppose as managers, part of our role is to develop our team. And part of that is give feedback. 
So sometimes we have to step out of our comfort zone to enable them to do the same, to enable them to grow and develop. And it's also about us developing too, isn't it? So, you know, as part, one of the skills you have to have as a manager is be able to give effective performance feedback. So if that is something that you've identified you're not overly competent with at the moment, then I suppose quite harshly, I'd say that's something to work on mm. um, because it is something you need to be able to do. You need to have those conversations. Um, and I'm not saying you're ever going to like them necessarily, mm. but they're necessary. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, you know yourself in HR, Trish, I'm sure there are lots of conversations you've had in your, you know, your career where you think, oh, God, I didn't overly like doing that, but it was it was needed. Yeah, I completely agree. There's been lots of those conversations, unfortunately, but I do think, you know, sometimes you just need to think about the end result. Mm. So the question of someone's underperforming, they're doing something that you don't want them to be doing. If you don't tell them, they don't have that chance to improve. I wish I tell myself that and then obviously use the models that you've mentioned to make sure that the feedback's fair, make sure I'm giving them specific examples. But it's kinder to tell someone as opposed mm. to leave it and then they've got no idea that they're not performing in the way that you want them to, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. And I've also done training with individuals on how to have an effective kind of performance appraisal themselves. So not just in the manager side, but also for the individuals. Mm. And one of the things I say there as well is, you know, if you're getting feedback, perhaps you're at a six monthly review. And if your boss is saying to you, you know, you're not performing, Trish, then the first question to throw back at them is, why haven't you told me this before? Mm. Because how how am I going to get even better if I don't know what I'm doing wrong? You're absolutely right. So, yeah, it is the kind of thing to do. So it may feel uncomfortable, but actually for the individual and for you as the manager long term, the outcome is much more favourable than it would be if you just bury your head in the sand, mm. um, which is is never worth doing. Mm. Um, and I, I, you probably noticed, I'm sure you have, but the, the language as well I use around things. So, you know, to to improve somebody's um, performance so they can be even better mm. is a very different message to to be better. Mm. So I use that word a lot because when you say to somebody, you know, I, I want you to be better at something, you're insinuating that they're rubbish at it. Mm. Now I guarantee, you know, they're not rubbish. There are development needs. But just even by putting a you know a small extra bit of language like even in there can really help deliver that message in a more, I suppose, a more positive um, and constructive way than mm. perhaps if you just you know say you know um, or give the impression that you're currently rubbish at your job. Mm. So, so I have to say that's something that I've stolen <laughs> as well. <laughs> consultancy life as well because when you're asking for feedback as well I think that language is also really useful so mm -hmm. when doing research for clients and they want me to find out about a specific thing that's happening in the organization asking someone well what could be even better about x as opposed to what's wrong with it it's a very mm -hmm. different way to ask a question and get different kind of information out of them so I've 100% stolen that Anita okay, that's absolutely fine <laughs> you can have that one on me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah well suppose so the next point in a bit of a roundabout way but what if someone is really demotivated by the feedback so I've followed all of the, the um the tools and models that you've mentioned I've been open I've been clear but the person kind of at the end of the conversation is really quite demotivated what do we do in those kind of situations well I think if you've got an inkling that that might be the case then probably the honest conversation model would be better because you've got that ask at the end of it Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't ask the question at the end of the SBI model. Of course you can. You can adapt it. You know, that's absolutely fine. But maybe by asking a question of what are your thoughts about this, mm. you'll get more of a sense about how they're feeling. They won't just, you know, I don't know, slope off and feel, you know, quite rejected about it. Um, but but actually by saying to somebody, how are you feeling, then they might, they might feel, actually, I don't agree that to be true. I don't, you know, I don't think that's the case. And that opens up then, OK, let's talk about that, mm -hmm. which is, again, where your evidence comes in play. And you want people to push back, don't you? You want people to challenge you as, as the manager. Of course you do. Um, but do it the right way, obviously. But, yeah, absolutely. I would suggest, you know, it, you can't stop somebody feeling the way they feel about something. What you can control is how you deliver that message. So knowing the individual, knowing how they like their feedback is important 
but also not avoiding it because you think they might get teary, which I've also had managers say to me too, oh gosh, you know, they might get upset, so I'm just not going to raise it with them. Mm -hmm. That's not fair either, as we've already discussed. So, so as much as you can, make it right for that person so it resonates well with them. And, you know, we will get that wrong sometimes. We've all done it. We've all been there. And I'm you know, I'm sure we'll still do it again in the future because you, you never quite know how somebody's feeling unless they're very, very open with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, yeah, I would suggest, you know, go on what you know about the individual. Ask the right questions so you understand a bit more. Um, and make it as collaborative as you can. So when we're talking about, let's say, performance improvement, for example, don't just set them targets say to them okay use a bit more of a coaching approach so okay so if you're you're here now where would you like to be in four weeks eight weeks whatever time scale whatever it is they're working on and really get them to buy into that or get them to come up with what they can do differently next time Mm -hmm. which is a really good way um of doing it like I when I give feedback if for example if I'm doing um uh like if I've done training on presentation skills that's a good example I would position it and if somebody I'll get somebody to do a bit of a um, bit of a short presentation and then I'll say, OK, I'm going to give you feedback on that. And my feedback will be based on what I thought you did really well and what I thought you could do differently next time to make it even better. Mm-hmm. And that will be the language. So they'll come away from that knowing what's gone well, but then some key pointers on what they can do differently mm-hmm. next time. Mm-hmm. So so again, it's based on the individual. It's based on what they need from it. Um, and really, that is so individual. Mm. but always having in your mind it's about improving confidence and improving competence Mm. um so it will help with the nerves like you said but also help with the you know help with how it lands I think and how you word it Mm. and you talked about kind of timeliness so when we're thinking about performance feedback that kind of um, feeds into I suppose some sort of an appraisal cycle or appraisal process is there any kind of regularity that people should be doing this or is it very much kind of what works for the organisation? Kind of what are your thoughts on that? In terms of feedback or the performance cycle? Um, uh, let's say both. <laughs> oh, okay. So, well, the performance cycle, there's lots of, uh, lots of chat around that at the minute, isn't it? I mean, you'll know this more than anyone, Trish, but there's a lot of people like the much more fluid approach of just regular monthly one-to-ones but you don't have this fixed point in time every six months or every 12 months where you have a set performance appraisal because it is so much more than that isn't it and I think organizations that do do the perhaps six and 12 months they tend to also do the monthly um so those six and 12 month points become a bit more of a shorter process I I think it depends on the organization I think it depends on 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 the the process that they've got surrounding that um have they you know have they got tools to make that simple for people to do I think there's so many different factors but as I would I've said this on many of occasion and uh, I'm sure I've had my wrist slapped a couple of times for saying this too that when we have performance reviews you know appraisals whatever you want to call them I don't care whether you write the outcome on the back of a stamp as long as we're having the conversation you know, some organisations have all singing, all dancing, fabulous, you know, either digital or not, um, methods of recording performance reviews, which are amazing. But if the quality conversation isn't happening, it's kind of a waste of time. So get that bit right first. Yes, invest in all those fabulous things, but get the conversations and that feedback and the process and the smart objective setting right first. And then you know have all the lovely stuff around it which makes it look pretty um because like I said unless your people know how to do all or, you know to demonstrate the behaviors then then you know that's not going to add the value that you want it to mm. um so I I don't suppose I have a, a definitive answer to that I think it's much more based on the organization and the people but as long as it's happening regularly Mm-hmm. as a manager as long as it's happening when it needs to happen which if you think about how often you know and again that's part of a conversation to have with somebody how often do you like to have feedback mm-hmm. um I know as an individual I like a lot of feedback it's just husband calls me needy I wouldn't suggest that but <laughs> <laughs> brave. but I, I, I'm <laughs> very brave um 
but I, you know, I do, I love feedback, good, bad or indifferent. I, I, you know, because it helps me to develop, but um, I think it's got to be right for the organization and it's got to happen on a regular basis. So whatever that looks like, really. So Anita, as always, it's been amazing talking to you and you're always super helpful. I think there's so much useful information in there for organizations and HR professionals as well. So thank you so much. My pleasure. If people want to get hold of you, how are they going to do that? How are they, how are they well, they can go onto the Tap HR website as um, obviously I'm working with yourself um, <laughs> as your L and D person. So please, you can contact me through the Tap HR website. Alternatively, I have got a website which is askscottbrooks.co.uk. Um, you can get hold of me there and all the usual socials. I'm on LinkedIn, etc. So yeah, absolutely available to help and support. And kind of my strap line is about helping people to be the best they can be, whether they be leaders, team members, whoever they are. And, and I, you know, I work with lots of organisations on de developing behaviours and leadership skills, which I absolutely love doing. Amazing. Well, well, thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. It won't be the last time that we do this. <laughs> good, good. Love a good chat. Maybe, maybe in person next time, Trish. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Take me up on that. And everyone's heard you because it's recorded. <laughs> Only over coffee, though. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I will leave it there. Otherwise, we'll just sit and giggle. But thank you, as always, for your time. Thanks ever so much. Take care. Yeah.